um, we're going to be talking today about issues of uh, context and uh, how that context is traditionally captured in what's called an environment within um, agent-based modeling uh, packages. The, the environment is central to the um, enterprise of agent-based modeling. Um, there are some adaptations or, or variants of agent-based modeling that are focused on just having diverse heterogeneous agents evolve independently. Microsimulation is traditionally like that. Um, but from its inception with uh, von Neumann and in further elaborations at Los Alamos National Labs, um, agent-based with the swarm efforts, for example, agent-based modeling has long prized a focus on agent-agent interaction through an environment. And, and also often an agent's interaction with the environment, even if it does not directly catalyze um, uh, a change in another uh, agent. Perhaps it's me, for example, coughing and, and leaving uh, aerosols from COVID-19 in the air. Perhaps it's uh, me uh, suffering from an antimicrobial resistant infection in a long-term care facility, um, leaving that on some surfaces of uh, MRSA, methicill methicillin resistant Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus aureus. Maybe it's aspects of um, deposition of uh, prions in the environment or me leaving a social mess a media message uh, that, uh, that has demeaning attitudes expressed in it uh, within, uh, within the context of online commenting. Um, all of these are aspects of how I might um, put something out in the environment uh, that might then later affect someone, but uh, another agent, but doesn't do so immediately. So I'd like to um, walk you through different roles that the uh, that context and the environment play within agent-based modeling. Um, and as you'll see, it plays diverse roles, um, some of which I've only, um, only some of which I've alluded to here. Okay, so where is, uh, there they are. Okay, right. Um, okay, um, so we'll get out of preview mode. This was used for your slides. Okay, so um, uh, the environment uh, within agent-based modeling um, is something that kind of completes the triad that Pawson and Tilly speak about in, in the application of critical realism to uh, policy decisions in, in social sciences. Um, um, and, and this has to do with uh, the combination of mechanism, something captured in agent-based modeling through causal mechanisms represented, things like state charts and events that fire and trigger actions, um, sending messages. Those are examples associated with mechanisms, like capturing real world mechanisms. We capture those using those constructs. Um, but uh, outcome is another um, component of this triad that Pawson and Tilly emphasize. And, and that really reflects uh, emergent behaviors that we see in agent-based models, but, but in, in, um, in models more generally that are of a um, uh, dynamic form, we, we expect uh, emergence. With system dynamics aggregate models, we expect an emergence over time from interactions of stocks and flows and feedbacks of different sorts and nonlinearity. Um, within agent-based modeling, um, the emergence is often the result of agent-agent interactions. But really what we're dealing with today is this issue of context um, about agents being situated in an environment that serves to influence them, serves as a mediator to how they affect others, um, and uh, something that, that may uh, end up sort of absorbing some of their influences more directly. Um, now, Context is captured within agent-based models in a variety of ways. And there's kind of different sorts of context that are captured with different constructs, different particular structures by which we represent them. Um, for example, social context is traditionally captured with family, with workplace, with school, with 
uh, or for, to represent things with family, with workplaces, with school and neighborhoods, uh, will often capture that in the form of networks um, by, by capturing the networks which are present. There are exceptions. We might have a hierarchical model where, for example, we have people placed in families and just by virtue of being in the same family, a member of the same family, there's assumed to be some measures of, of, of common context and connection there. That, that is possible. Uh, we often, in these agent-based models, represent geography. And uh, we have a geographic settings associated with this. Um, we have uh, a spatially explicit context, which can be, for example, indoor or outdoor, but which depicts a person's position within a facility or within a, mm -hmm. a small outdoor uh, area that's not so much geographic, but, um, but depicted geometrically. Um, and uh, we can have uh, we can have networks uh, of of multiple sorts, which represent different aspects of of linkage. Maybe collegial relationships, family relationships, uh, online gaming relationships, what have you. Um, and often we we use hierarchical nesting to capture the fact that we have say people and families and families and neighborhoods and neighborhoods and cities, etc. Um, now, within system dynamics modeling, we made a, a lot of use of this kind of random mixing, uh, as we called it. Those, those on the call will, will remember uh, things like multiplying C times I over N, where I is the number of infects of C is the contact rate, times beta, um, times the number of susceptibles. Um, if we leave out the susceptibles, it's the force of infection. Um, that assumed random mixing, that each susceptible is equally likely to run into any other infective. And, and you know, in, in some cases, like circulating in a bus station or a, a large, uh, a large uh, party that goes on for hours, that might not be a bad assumption. But um, in many cases, there's more structure to it. We have things like networks that mediate our connections and and mean that I don't mix equally well with everyone in Saskatoon, but disproportionately with certain groups. Um, so here we're, we're often situating agents in particular subcontexts. And sometimes we have mobility between other contexts. The agent may up and move, you know, from one subcontext to another, or, or an even, even from one context entirely to a different one um, that, um, that is, different from what we deal with within, um, within uh, aggregate system dynamics modeling. Um, but at any one time, an agent's gonna be in a position in a certain subcontext. Maybe it's a location within a, uh, a building, within a long-term care facility. Maybe it's uh, a certain geographic sphere or area. Maybe it's a location in a network. They're going to, have impinging upon them influences by that area and they'll influence that little area. Um, and they'll interact with other agents often in that area. Uh, and traditionally we capture all this with something called an environment, okay? And um, we can see this in some of our models. And if you'd like to open one or two of them up, you can open up this, um, this is chlamydia, uh, Committee of Gonorrhea, but it's a CTNG with Network Dynamics version nine. <laughs> yeah, I, I built this for uh, Northern Intertribal Health Authority one night, and um, I was, it was quite a it was a nighter. Um, but um, it, it it depicts, for example, Prince Albert and um, factors there, and you might want to open the gridded hybrid model as well. Um, uh, while I'm going through this slide, you can get those open, but um, within uh, agent-based modeling, uh, we typically have agents whose sphere of influencing factors and whose influence outwards um, is localized, meaning it, it doesn't extend over the whole space. Just because I sneeze doesn't mean, you know, someone down in Cypress Hills catches the flu, much less someone in Adelaide in Australia. Um, uh, it's, it tends to be local impacts and I tend to be disproportionately impacted by local phenomenon. Um, 
uh, whether it's local weather uh, geographically or whether it's factors having to do with the people in my particular connections, my particular housemates or family or works, workmates, what level of COVID-19 infection do they have that disproportionately impacts mine? Um, so uh, there's this kind of localized effect and sometimes it's localized effect on decision-making and perception. So for example, when I'm driving, um, if there's a bend in the road, I might slow down because I can't see what's ahead of it and I don't want to run into a traffic jam. Less, less of a problem here in Saskatoon than it is in Southern California, I can tell you from experience. Um, but um, you know, the road conditions ahead, it's curvature, uh, the visibility because of obstacles like that, that darn bridge in PA on Albert Street, um, you know, that, that, that uh, prevent good visibility, they can, um, they can lead to changes in, in behavior and in, in perception and therefore changes in behavior. Our sense of risk from COVID-19 is markedly changed if someone we know might have been hospitalized for it. Um, uh, or, you know, the changes, uh, the risks associated with smoking, for example. Um, so these local effects have disproportionate impacts. And, and to kind of examine some of these ideas, I'd like to, to go to some examples. Whoa, um, where is it? Here we are. Okay. So I'm going to open up um, uh, here um, the first of those. And um, if you'd like, we can run it together. So here is PA, right? Here's Prince Albert. Um, and uh, we have a geographic specific map of PA. And we have some various outcomes associated with, um, with spread of um, gonorrhea and chlamydia within PA. Um, uh, and if we run this, we will find that agents uh, within this model are, um, Okay, now, now, now what's up? Um, I didn't try running this with, with running Zoom, but um, uh, okay, now, now, we're, now we're in trouble. Wow, this is really cool. That's okay, so something unexpected has happened, but okay, now I'm, I'm most wedged. Uh, I don't know if you folks can, can still hear me. Anyone out there to hear me? Yeah, we can I hear can you, hear. but I think your screen is frozen. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, um, this is uh, this is quite something computationally. Um, I'll be. Um, I my my. So I I run Linux here. I'm going to try the. Uh, okay. You can. No, we can. No, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Well. Uh, um. Let, let's just see <laughs> see what's up here. Wow. Okay. Um. Bad things are happening. Uh, I'm just going to kill any logic. Boom. Okay, let's 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 see what happens now. Um, uh, okay, uh, can you still hear me? We can. Now we can hear you. Now. Hey, your back. <laughs> okay, this is this is really <laughs> fun. Um, I, I suspect it's less fun for you, but um, uh, I get to go and frob uh, frob things uh, behind the scenes uh, during my class. So. Um, yeah, bad things are happening. Maybe it's running for you. Can can any of you get that running? Houston, we have a problem. Can anyone get that running? Okay, I'm not not hearing overwhelming yeses. I think I have it running now. Okay. Okay. Good. Cause, um, yeah, that was, um, I've been a long time user of any logic, but I've never seen that. Um, I'm gonna, I, I'm, I have to phone that home to the mother ship. Um, uh, okay. So, so we will try this again. And if it fails again, we'll know why I'll get my cousin, uh, my, my twin on here if, if needed. Um, okay. Let's, let's try this. Um, uh, um uh, okay one more time uh, okay okay now it's a happy camper um okay can you okay so can you see my screen yeah we yeah. can see it. yes yeah we can okay okay so here's pa um and um 
Uh, Prince Albert uh, is is shown with associated with uh, its street layout and, and kind of geographic context, but within Prince Albert are scattered um, a set of synthetically generated, um, endogenously produced features uh, associated with the model. I, I should be careful there because some of the features here, like their colors and the the width of the lines are indicative of endogenous features, um, but these calculated locations of hobes are really just kind of calculated randomly at the beginning. So you could kind of think of them as, as um, exogenous. Um, but we have a set of uh, clinics here and we have a set of homes um, and those homes are indicated by virtue of their, um, uh, th their infection status. And, um, uh, some of these homes uh, may may get uh, infected over time, and the infection would spread from one home to the next. Uh, right now, um, and I didn't do my my homework to to start with the right number of of infections in this, but um, we have uh, we have some prevalence of of uh, chlamydia, which is uh, is spreading, and we have some. Oh, this needs to run. To be to be useful. There we go. Um, so uh, you know we have um, a characterization here of uh, the number of infections people have gotten. Those who practice uh, um, uh, consistent safe sex or no safe sex, and um, and prevalence within the population of these sexually transmitted infections. And as it spreads, you'll find it proceeding to various households. And a household's uh, clinic presentation will be based on their distance from the clinic. So they'll go to the nearest clinic. And, um, and uh, this can be useful for, for reasoning about the flow of individuals, for example, and other models to hospitals and, and how many people might be expected when you have a certain demographics in the population. But this is um, a situation where you might have, whoa, um, might have people who disproportionately impact to others close by. And certainly in their own community, so uh, you know they're more likely to have a sexual partner in their own community than in a, a far away, a far, far away area of the province. So that's an example of a model which is geographically situated, and where people have influence from others who are nearby. Um, in this case, geographically, this next one, this gridded hybrid model. Um, which uh, hopefully won't won't cause uh, problems there. Let's just uh, open this up. Um, so we will see. Um, oh, okay. Um, we're going to need. Do you have the gridded hybrid model there? If you is that a yes? Yeah, we have the model. In the okay. File. If you open up the gridded hybrid model what you'll find is that uh, it depicts a set of patches. These patches are stylized representations of geographic areas, um, but each patch is notable for being having its dynamics characterized by, um, by system dynamics. But they're agents, the patches themselves are agents and they interact with other nearby agents and other patches. Um, so we built this model with partners in the veterinary science area, if I'm not mistaken, for sea lice, but we have similar models for mosquitoes and indeed for birds that serve as the reservoir for West Nile, which is mosquito-borne illness uh, that has reached levels here in Saskatchewan that have no parallel elsewhere in the Western Hemisphere. And um, in this model, you will see for each patch kind of uh, dynamics going on as indicated by its color, okay? And each patch is influenced by the populations in the patches that are nearby. Um, and, uh, and those nearby patches can spread uh, some of these sea lice in this case, it could be spread of West Nile, West Nile bearing mosquitoes uh, to, to other nearby patches. And so there's kind of a, 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 a diffusion 
of this um, of this population um, across. It breeds in any one patch, but it can spread to other patches and move across. And if you imagine red would mean more West Nile infection, um, the humans living in that patch would need to be pretty careful about infection. So this is another way in which context might influence a person. They depend on their nearby uh, nearby neighbors. Um, I will just open another model that you don't need to get from the site, but it's part of the example models here. And that's this model called the Schelling segregation model. Um, well, actually, first we'll go to Conway's Game of Life, and then we'll go to the the, the Schelling segregation model. So um, Conway's Game of Life should be uh, here. Um, so uh, give me a moment. Um, okay, I don't um, I don't see it. I thought it was uh, under Conway, but maybe they got rid of it for this version of any logic. Um, if any, oh, there it is, the game of life. They put a T in front of it. Okay. Um, um, great. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a, this is a model of great significance in the computing space. Uh, I alluded to this model on some previous occasion. If you want to run it, you'll find it consists of a set of patches, and each patch is live or dead, and um, and uh, the it it its evolution. What if it's alive? Whether it continues to live or not will depend on the number of neighbors that are living. And if it's empty, dead, and it has nothing in it its chance of getting colonized will depend on the number of neighbors. Um, and there's specific rules uh, governing it um, as to what will allow a cell to continue to live or what will allow it, what will cause it to, uh, to be colonized. Um, but this particular model was responsible for massive amounts of computation um, during the early 70s and, and maybe it was late 60s, but uh, uh, early computer scientists and hackers were were running things with the game of life and developed all sorts of interesting um, insights into the game. They also proved that it was computationally universal, meaning anything you can implement on a Turing machine uh, as far as uh, performing mm -hmm. computations, and indeed anything you could do on your personal laptop or on your phone could indeed be done using the game of life as a computing engine, which is an interesting factoid. You can actually build computers in here, which will simulate um, which will compute uh, programs, um, and you encode those programs in a certain clever way. Um, this is a local system. Each cell depends only on its neighbors for its evolution. And if you change the rules, it will look totally different. Um, but this is one, again, where the environment affects the, uh, the agent. The final one I want to show, though, is the shelling segregation model. Well, well, okay, we'll get to that. It, the most natural time is to show that in another minute when we talk about mobility. So um, there's issues of where an agent's located in space at any one time. And typically in an age-based model, they'll have local influences that affect them in that little area, their perception, what their how their health evolves or whatever will be affected, um, but um, also what they affect. But often, in these models will often have a degree of mobility. So we'll situate agents, but they can up and move. Um, in that model of PA, people didn't move. They, they were situated at their homes and, and we abstract away from, from movement. Um, with with um, models that incorporate mobility, the idea is that agents move in response often to needs or to habits um, or to, um, to desires, preferences. Um, and uh, mobility here um, is sometimes treated continuously and sometimes discontinuous. Continuous would be they kind of move in a smooth way. Discontinuous mean they jump, okay? Um, let's take an example of jumping, okay? Um, so um, we're gonna go back to any logic, here we go. And we're going to open up another built-in model. So example models. And uh, this is going to be the shelling segregation model, which uh, I think I've alluded to in 
passing in, in uh, class. Um, here it is down here in the S's. Um, and it's named after the Nobel Prize winning economist, Thomas Schelling. And I mentioned to you that he played it first on a, on a checkerboard. Um, if you go and you run this model, um, what you will find is um, the, the same general insight that he found. Um, if we have people have a certain preference to, um, to have people like them, and I'm gonna dial this down here. So the idea here is we're expressing with this slider a preference that people have for how much they want to live like people who look like them. And there's two types of people and blank spaces. So each person is situated at a certain patch and they're either a, a red person or a black person. Um, uh, and some patches are empty. That's that's the um, the kind of tan, tan color there. Um, and you'll notice that if you, if you um, were to start this with a very low setting, for example, here, um, and I'm gonna turn down the, the time here so I can have time to drag this down. If they really have no preference one way or the other for, for who they associate with, there's, you know, there's not really much in the way of patterns. As they gain you know, more patterning, what you're, what you're gonna see is a, um, some, continuity some some patterns that emerge that are uh, that are, are not totally you know all over the place and chaotic uh, everything goes everywhere it's um you'll start to see continuous you know sort of patchworks of of one color uh, with another the entropy is is lower if we raise it to something like uh, uh, 50 percent here you'll find large patches. Now, what this is saying is here, people will have a certain propensity to move if, if, um, if, if there's not a, at least 50%, or in this case, 56% of the people near them are not their own color, they'll, they'll move. Um, and you can see it leads to this assortment, this kind of people moving in with uh, to, to neighborhoods with lots of people like them, and this level of 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 degree of kind of cohesive uh, of of uh, homo homogeneity that often will will cover large patches. And as you up it, you know you will find um, uh, further uh, further propensity until it becomes infeasible and people are just moving around on a continuous basis. Now the exact you know, outcomes will depend on exactly how the rules are calculated. But here there's mobility. Um, that's, uh, sorry, this is beyond what we had in that other model, the, the game of life. Um, so mobility here was made by jumping. They jumped over to another location if they were, you know, they felt the people nearby them didn't look similar enough. This is again of a cloth with the things I spoke about at the beginning of lecture. Um, you know, there's there truly is, and from a complex system standpoint, there it's it's a genuine thing. It's not some wishy washy, you know, squishy thing. It's it's actually there's real benefits that come from diversity and. And uh, what we can see is this sort of homogeneity, this monoculture that develops that can be quite fragile in, in many cases. Um, uh, if you have too much um, preference translated into, um, into action. Um, so, you know, common patterns for mobility is, look, you move to more preferable location. We just saw the, the Shelley segregation. Or another one is you seek out other agents for certain needs. So you go in search of a mate, or you go in search of social interaction. You you seek out other other people for for interaction, um, for or maybe you seek out a drug dealer to buy uh, narcotics. Um, uh, maybe you seek out a a, a healthcare provider uh, to provide some um, some um, care. Um, to give a consultation on a troubling rash or what have you. Here you, you might seek out a specific resource um, for that. Might be food or goods, um, uh, seek out um, a site for water uh, for, for animals, uh, for, for example, deer in our COVID-19, our, COVID our chronic wasting disease model. 
um, or you seek out vaccination or education or for social interaction. Um, uh, that's that's a common pattern. Let's go take a look at a, a model that I provided you that shows that. So there's a, a model that is um, called multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects and lock-in. I, I know that's that's a bit of a, a mouthful. Um, multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects and lock-in. Just remember it as lock-in in the name and, and you'll be good. Um, and uh, I am in a position to have malice of forethought of having it already open. Um, so if you wanna open it up, um, what you will see is uh, we have a model here, which um, depicts the spread of infectious disease. And we have various records here. We have several types of, of agents. We have clinics, which process people. This is articulated with the language of discrete event simulation, which we'll be coming to after agent-based modeling. We have homes, which have a singularly simple representation of a roof over people's heads. And we have persons who have behavior that's reduced to two state charts, uh, one with respect to infection and another one dealing with concerns related to care seeking behavior, okay? And um, this model, um, and I'd invite you to run the uh, baseline uh, for it, uh, this model um, uh, depicts uh, people within the context of a community. Um, uh, people live with uh, uh, alone or, or with others within homes. Um, and uh, there's a variety of homes, a variety of people. So I guess uh, 1,200 people, 400 homes, so about three people per home. And there's a clinic here. And if you run the model, um, what you'll find um, is a reflection of the fact that, ah, you'll notice that this, this, what do you think this transition reflects? I'm going to pause the model for a second. Um, those on the call, what do you think this transition reflects from infective back to symptomatic? If there's a transition that goes from someone who's infective to someone who's, uh, who's sorry, to symptomatic, to susceptible, uh, what would that be? It would be what? Recovery? Recovery. It's recovery. And in this case, it's triggered by a message. And if you go look at that message, the message is, thou art cured. Okay? So they have to be cured. Um, uh, not like bacon or hides are cured, but like, like you know, you're cured by the health system. Um, I, I developed this model live in, in um, Melbourne, I think it was. And we had some fun with that. <laughs> they they undergo the healing beam in the um, uh, in the context of the um, uh, of the care clinic. So here's the care clinic, and you'll find that a successful treatment sends them a message. Uh, mumble uh, here it is. Uh, it sends them uh, a message uh, that they are cured. Okay. Um, uh, so the person, if they're cured by the clinic they recover, otherwise they stay infective. Uh, they remain infective. So this is treatment mediated immunity. So they need to go to this clinic to get treated in order to recover. And what that leads to is a, is a situation where if the clinic's not fast enough treating people, you can get a buildup of uh, infection within the population. And you get a disproportionate number of people in the population who are ill because the more people that are ill in the population, the more it spreads, the more it spreads, the more people have to come to the clinic, the more people come to the clinic, the longer the waiting times at the clinic, the longer they're infected and, and the, the more people they can spread it to. And so here treatment, like the time till recovery is endogenous. It depends on how long they're waiting, at, have to wait at the clinic. And the more people in line, the longer they have to wait, the more people they can spread it to. So with the default situation, with the clinic staffed as it, level, uh, as it is by default, the infection will reach very high levels of prevalence. It's really troubling. So here's the illness count over time. Um, and here's the number of times I think different people have, have, have gotten uh, infected. And this is the prevalence of infection in the community. 
Uh, by contrast, um, we're going to restart that. And uh, if we go and we use a button artfully hidden at the top, so you pull down there. And if I go and I add clinics in, I'm going to add uh, another clinic, for example. Um, uh, let's go see what, what happens then. Oh, look, the infection went extinct. Let's let's try that again. Maybe it was just a fluke, right? Um, here we go. So uh, I'm going to start. Um, we have just one clinic. The infection, whoa, it's going up. Uh, now we're going to add a clinic. We're going to add a couple more clinics. So uh, I've added a couple of clinics now. I think there's uh, three or four here. Yeah, four of them, I think. And and yet we haven't brought the infection down to a very low level. So I don't know if you got that, but if you start the model, go start the model from its inception, the very start, you add one clinic, just one clinic, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and I'm going to do it in this clever way here. Boom. Um, I'm going to start the model and, and go view the, uh, the top. So here's our clinic, right? Um, if we add another clinic in right away and we run it, two clinics, just two clinics, and we run it, the infection never gets established. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Two clinics, the infection is kept at essentially non-existent. Okay, you might you might say, well, that's that's great. I'm gonna take this model without actually running it uh, yet. Uh, I'm gonna do that, and here we observe uh, just one clinic at the beginning. But instead of adding a second clinic now, I'm going to run this thing for a while and let the infection build up to very high levels. You'll notice it kind of meanders around and then it goes wild and it spreads like crazy at this transition point. Now I'm gonna add in one clinic, boom. So I, sorry, I, uh, one more clinic. So I have another clinic in there. Um, so I, I have two clinics now. Um, why am I not seeing the infection brought down to, to extinction? Let's add a third clinic. I just added a third clinic. It's going down. Yeah, it's going down. It had salutary effects. We have three clinics, but it hasn't going, it's not going extinct. Let's add four clinics in. Four clinics. It's not going extinct. Five clinics. Still not going extinct. Think about that. Two clinics prevented from getting started. Here we're picking up, right? We're picking up the pieces. It already had gotten established at very, very high levels. And even five clinics is not enough to wipe it out. Six clinics. Ah, six clinics brings it down to extremely low levels and final extinction. Six clinics, ladies and gentlemen. If we, if we had just acted in early, a stitch in time would have saved nine. If we had acted at the very get-go, having one extra clinic, we could have prevented it from ever getting established. We needed six clinics to bring it into abatement, to eliminate it after the fact, because we were dealing with huge numbers of people that needed to get treated. And to bring those waiting times down far enough, we need many clinics. This is an example of lock-in effects. But it's also an example of people seeking out care. People, I didn't, I didn't emphasize it, but people here were seeking out the nearest clinic to, to go to. So, so when there was only one clinic, they didn't have much opportunity. But as you added in more clinics, they were going to the nearest clinic. And if you went and looked at the logic here, um, you will find that they get the nearest agent amongst the clinics uh, when they start out and then uh, they, and they head there. Um, they, they, they move to the nearest clinic's X and Y location and they go there and they try to secure care, okay? So this is an example of a model where they seek out care. Um, in other cases, they'll circulate among standard life sphere, they'll go in certain paths. Um, they'll engage in wandering um, that may 
may uh, uh, bring about certain exposures, um, or they'll they'll uh, move in according to kind of flocking behavior. Um, and flocking behavior is something that um, you will find within any Logic Illustrated as well. And this will be our our last little example. If you go to any Logic example models, there should be a model called. Boyds. Oh man, they eliminated Boyds. It looks like. Um, uh, I'm wondering. Oh, there it is. Flock of Boyds. Okay. Um, it's called Flock of Boyds instead of just Boyds. Okay. Um, this is a model of of flocking behavior. We have we have uh, things that might be analogized to fish or or uh, birds or well, bats don't really flock, but um, not in large numbers. Um, uh, but uh, the probably other, um, uh, yeah, probably uh, grasshoppers or cic cicadas or something like that probably probably exhibit flocking behavior. Certain types of insects, right? I suppose you could say ants flock too, but we don't normally use that word for them. Um, so uh, here we have. Here we have uh, some some movements. Okay, <laughs> this one they're engaged in in um, martial combat, um, but um, uh, there's a certain amount of flocking that goes on, and you can see these fluid fluid movements where it's not like each one is plots their course independently of another. Okay, that isn't that helpful. Um, it's that uh, they're influenced by the behavior of those around them. So if if there's a leader and they you know go one direction, the others will tend to follow, and you can kind of see it here. So this is flocking behavior, which may lead to um, uh, may lead to individual uh, boys, you know, putting aside their preferences in order to accord with uh, the collective. Um, so. Uh, uh, this is uh, another uh, another you know feature by which mobility is often governed. So, you know, when it's combined with contagion, mobility can actually have really big effects. We think of contagion from system dynamics as spreading along, you know, within a, a society through random mixing. In traditional agent-based modeling, you have people in networks and spreading it via network connections. We'll see some of that next time with additional models. Um, but here, what we're seeing um, with mobility would be not only can, can infection reach you through your network connections that you have with other situated people, but movement of people between areas can bring infection. Think about people flying back and forth to Australia or for New, to New Zealand from US. They could bring COVID-19 there, which is why they put them up in COVID hotels um, and keep a close watch on them uh, and call them to make them make sure you're, they're still in the hotel, et cetera. Um, or think about someone bringing COVID to Saskatchewan, to remote communities in Saskatchewan's north, for example. We can have this bringing of, of pathogen over uh, borders, um, bring it from one network to another that can lead to dramatically different behavior and accelerated spread well beyond what you'd get by spreading within a network, a static network itself. Um, we'll see some examples of this further next time. We'll talk about spatial embedding. Um, I've actually provided you this E. coli Klebsiella model that provides an illustration and a in a care facility. Um, this is from uh, one of the students in the class, Sean, um, for uh, 3D environments for, for mixing uh, associated with uh, movie theaters. Um, we'll also see how you could change networks uh, over time in ways that uh, shape someone's risks or someone's effects. And finally, we'll take a look at hierarchical nesting of context, capturing the effects on a person, say, for being embedded in a city, uh, and that city is just one of a variety in, in, a, in, a, in a region. Okay, um, so I'm cutting my short, uh, my uh, comments short in this section because of the even more important preamble to this. Uh, please do take those, um, those messages to heart. 
Uh, but we will pick up where we left off with respect to the role of environments. And next time, we'll be going through a set of about five different network types systematically that, that um, are very common in agent-based modeling and are well supported in any logic. And we'll get into the topic of scale-free networks, uh, just putting our toe in that water that will occupy us for the later half of next week. Okay. So thank you very much. I'm planning to hold office hours right after this and glad to talk in about five minutes. I will also be planning to post uh, assignment three uh, within uh, by the by this weekend at the extreme latest, and uh, we'll uh, we'll look forward to covering some additional material that will help you address it within our our next few classes here. Thanks very much and see some of you in office hours. Take care, stay safe, and stay on guard against those attitudes.